which is intended or likely to cause death or great bodily harm only if the defendant reasonably, reasonably believed that the force was force used was necessary to prevent imminent death or great bodily harm to himself. The belief may be reasonable even though mistaken. In de determining whether the defendant's beliefs were reasonable, the standard is what a person of ordinary intelligence and prudence would have believed in the defendant's position under the circumstances at the time of the alleged offense. The reasonableness of the defendant's beliefs must be determined from the standpoint of the defendant at the time the defendant acts and not from the viewpoint of the jury now. The state must prove by evidence which satisfies you beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant did not act lawfully in self-defense. If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that both elements of first degree intentional homicide have been proved and that the defendant did not act lawfully in self-defense, you should find the defendant guilty. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty. The second third counts of the information charge that on or about Tuesday, October, I'm sorry, August 4th, 2020, in the city of Oshkosh, Winnebago County, Wisconsin, Joshua W. Aid attempted to cause the deaths of John F. Miller and Rebecca Borkowski with intent to kill each of, the respect, each of them respectively, contrary to Wisconsin statutes. To these charges, the defendant has entered pleas of not guilty, which means that the state must prove every element of the offense charge beyond a reasonable doubt. The defendant is charged in two counts, uh, is count, charged with two counts of attempted first degree intentional homicide. The crime of attempted first degree intentional homicide is defined in sections 939.32 and 940.01 the criminal code of Wisconsin is committed by one who with intent to commit first degree intentional homicide does act towards the commission of that crime which demonstrate unequivocally under all of the circumstances that he had formed the intent and would commit the crime except for the intervention of another person or some other extraneous factor. Before you may find the defendant guilty of this offense, the state must prove by evidence which satisfies you beyond a reasonable doubt the following two elements were present for each count. Number one, the defendant intended to call to kill John J. Miller and Rebecca Borkowski. Intended to kill means that the defendant had the mental purpose to take the life of another human being or was aware that his conduct was practically certain to cause the death of another human being. Number two, the defendant did act did acts towards the commission of the crime of first degree intentional homicide, which demonstrate unequivocally under all of the circumstances that the defendant intended to kill or would have killed John J. Miller and Rebecca Barkowski, except for the intervention of another person or some other extraneous factor. Unequivocally means that no other interference or conclusion can reasonably and fairly be drawn from the defendant's acts under the circumstances. Uh, the person means any person but the defendant and may include the intended victim. And extenuating circumstances or factor is something outside the knowledge of the defendant and outside the control of the defendant. While the law requires the defendant act with intent to kill, it does not require that the intent existed for any particular length of time before the act is committed. The act need not be brewed over, considered, or reflected upon for a week, day, hour, or even a minute. There need not be any appreciable time before the formation of the intent and the act. The intent to kill may be formed at any time before the act, including the instant before the act, and must continue to exist at the time of the act. You cannot be in a person's mind to find intent. Intent must be found, if found at all, from the defendant's acts, words, and statements, if any, and from all of the facts and circumstances in this case bearing upon intent. Intent should not be confused with motive. While proof of intent is necessary for conviction, proof of motive is not. Is not. Motive refers to a person's reason for doing something. Uh, motive may be shown as circumstance to aid in establishing the guilt of the defendant. The state is not required to prove motive on the part of the defendant in order to convict. 
evidence of motive does not by itself establish guilt, it should give it, you should give it the weight that you believe it deserves under all of the circumstances. Once again, self-defense is an issue with respect to these counts also. The law of self-defense allows a defendant to threaten to use force against another only if the defendant believes that there is actual or imminent unlawful interference with the defendant's person and the defendant believed that the amount of force the defendant used to threaten or to use or to use was necessary to prevent or terminate the interference and three that the defendant's belief was reasonable the defendant may intentionally use force which is intended or likely to cause death or great bodily harm only if the defendant reasonably believed that the force used was necessary to prevent imminent death to prevent imminent death or bodily injury to himself or great bodily harm to himself the belief may be reasonable although mistaken in determining whether the defendant's belief was reasonable the standard is what a person of ordinary intelligence and prudence would have believed in the defendant's position under the circumstances as they existed at the time of the alleged offense the reasonableness of the defendant's beliefs must not or must be determined from the standpoint of the defendant at the time the defendant's acts and not from the viewpoint of the jury now. The state must prove by evidence that satisfies you beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant did not lawfully act in self-defense. If you are satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt that both elements of attempted first degree intentional homicide have been proven and the defendant has not lawfully acted in self-defense, you should find the defendant guilty. If you are not so satisfied, you must find the defendant not guilty. In reaching your verdict, examine the evidence with care and caution. Act with judgment, reason, and prudence. Defendants are not required to prove their innocence. The law presumes every person charged with commission of an offense to be innocent. This presumption requires a finding of not guilty unless in your deliberations you find it is overcome by evidence which satisfies you beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty. The burden of establishing every fact necessary to constitute guilt is upon the state. Before you may return a verdict of guilty, the evidence must satisfy beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty. If you can reconcile the evidence upon any reasonable hypothesis consistent with the defendant's innocence, you should do so and return a verdict of not guilty. In determine, or the term reasonable doubt means a doubt based upon reason and common sense. It is a doubt for which a reason can be given arising from a fair and rational consideration of the evidence or lack of evidence. It means such a doubt as would cause a person of ordinary prudence to pause or hesitate when called upon to act in the most important affairs of life. A reasonable doubt is not a doubt which may be based upon mere guesswork or speculation. A doubt which arises merely from sympathy or from fear to return a verdict of guilt is not a reasonable doubt. A reasonable doubt is not a doubt such as may be used to escape the responsibility of a decision. While it is your duty to give the defendant the benefit of every reasonable doubt, you are not to search for doubt. You are to search for the truth. An information is nothing more than a written formal accusation against the defendant charging the commission of one or more criminal acts. You are not to consider it as evidence against the defendant in any way. It does not arise any inference of guilt. Evidence is first the sworn testimony of the witnesses both on direct and cross-examination regardless of who called the witness. Second, the exhibits the court has received whether or not the exhibit goes to the jury room. Third, any facts which the lawyers or parties have stipulated or agreed or which the court has directed you to find. Anything you may have seen or heard outside this courtroom is not evidence. You are to decide this case based solely on the evidence solely on the evidence offered and received at trial. It is not necessary that every fact be proved directly by a witness or an exhibit. A fact may be proved indirectly by circumstantial evidence. Circumstantial evidence is evidence which a jury may logically find other facts according to common knowledge and experience. Circumstantial evidence is not necessarily better or worse than direct evidence. Any type of evidence can prove a fact. 
when the evidence is direct or circumstantial, it must satisfy beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant committed the offense before you may find the defendant guilty. In weighing the evidence, you may take into account matters of your common knowledge and your observations and experiences in the affairs of life. Remarks of the attorneys are not evidence. If remarks suggest that certain facts suggest certain facts, not an evidence, disregard the suggestion. Consider carefully the closing arguments of the attorneys, but their arguments and conclusions and opinions are not evidence. Draw your own conclusions from the evidence and decide upon your verdict according to the evidence under the instructions given to you by the court. An exhibit becomes evidence only when received by the court. An exhibit marked for identification and not received is not evidence. An exhibit, or an exhibit received is evidence, whether or not it goes to the jury room. Attorneys for each side have a right and a duty to object to what they consider are improper questions asked of the witness or witnesses and to the admission of other evidence which they believe is not properly admissible. Do not draw any conclusion from the fact that an objection was made. By allowing testimony or other evidence to be received over the objection, the court is not indicating any opinion about the evidence. You jurors are the judges of the credibility of the witnesses and the weight to be given to the, ev to the evidence. Disregard entirely any questions that the court did not allow to be answered. Do not guess at what the witness's answer might have been. If the question itself suggested that certain facts might be true, ignore the suggestion and do not consider it as evidence. Evidence has been presented relating to the defendant's conduct after the alleged crime was committed. Whether the evidence shows a consciousness of guilt and whether consciousness of guilt shows actual guilt are matters exclusively for you to decide. Intent should not be confused with motive. While proof of intent is necessary to a conviction, proof of motive is not. Motive refers to a person's reason for doing something. While motive may show, may be, may be shown as a circumstance to get aid in establishing the guilt of the defendant, the state is not required to prove motive on the part of the defendant in order to convict. Evidence of motive does not by itself establish guilt. You should give it the weight that you believe it deserves under all of the circumstances. The weight of the evidence does not depend on the number of witnesses for each side. You may find that the testimony of one witness is entitled to greater weight than that of another witness or even several other witnesses. It is the duty of the jury to scrutinize and to weigh the testimony of the witnesses and to determine the effect of the evidence as a whole. You are the sole judges of the credibility, that is, the believability of the witnesses and the weight to be given to their testimony. In determining the credibility of each witness and the weight to be given to the testimony of each witness, consider these factors. Whether the witness has an interest or lack of interest in the result of this trial, the witness's conduct, appearance, and demeanor on the witness stand, the clearness or lack of clearness of the witness's recollection, the opportunity the witness had for knowing or for observing and knowing the matters the witness testified about, the reasonableness of the witness's testimony, the apparent intelligence of the witness, bias or prejudice of any has been shown, possible motives for falsifying testimony, and all other facts and circumstances during the trial which tend to either support or to discredit the testimony. Then give to the testimony of each witness the weight you believe it should receive. The defendant has testified in this case and you should not discredit the testimony just because the defendant is charged with a crime. Use the same factors to determine the credibility and the weight of the defendant's testimony that you use to evaluate the testimony of any other witness. There is no magic way for you to evaluate testimony. Instead, you should use your common sense and experience. In everyday life, you determine for yourself the reliability of the things people say to you. You should do the same thing here. Ordinarily, a witness may testify only about facts. However, a witness with a specialized knowledge in a particular field may give an opinion in that field. In determining the weight to be given to this opinion, you should consider the qualifications and credibility of the witness, the facts upon which the opinion is based, and the reason given for the opinion. 
opinion evidence was received to help you reach a conclusion. However, you are not bound by the witness's opinion. Evidence has been received that one of the witnesses in this trial has been convicted of crimes. This evidence was received solely because it bears upon the credibility of the witness. It must not be used for any other purpose. Evidence has been received that the defendant, Joshua W. Abe, has been convicted of a crime. This evidence was received solely because it bears upon the credibility of the defendant as a witness. It must not be used for any other purpose, and particularly you should bear in mind that a criminal conviction at some at some previous time is not proof of guilt of the offense now charged. We will now start with Ms. Nash's opening, or uh, I'm sorry, closing arguments. Ladies and gentlemen, you do get a copy of these instructions to take with you. I usually say that at the beginning, and I looked up once during the instructions and I got this here in the headlights look for you. Don't worry, you get these. 